Module 44 goes in more detail about the differences between fixed and floating exchange rate regimes. And we'll talk about if a country that currently has a fixed exchange rate wants to change that to some other set price, how they go about doing that. And finally, which type of exchange rate regime, fixed or floating, is better to insulate your country during a recession. I want to talk just a little bit about trade barriers and how they impact international markets since Unit 7 is all about open economies. Trade barriers tend to reduce international trade as the name barrier implies. So, so some categories of trade barriers are tariffs. Tariffs are a tax on imports. And so remember imports are goods that are produced by other countries and then bought by citizens in your country. So you would do a tariff if you were trying to encourage people to buy products made at your country because it will make products made abroad cost more. So in this picture we can see that if American cloth costs four dollars a roll and cloth made in Britain also costs four dollars a roll, there's no incentive to encourage people in your country to buy the product made in your country. But if a trade tariff is imposed and this case it's a 25% tariff so that's going to make the $4 British cloth now cost $5 so it is now relatively more expensive than the product made in America so you can see that it will help businesses in your country but it also discourages trade because people are going to be less interested in buying products made in other countries if they cost more the next category of trade barriers are quotas so sometimes there are some international products allowed, but only up until a certain point. So they limit the amounts perhaps in one year that can be brought into your country. And that is going to reduce the competition that American businesses will have. Finally, embargoes are policies that outlaw trade in a certain product. So one example here, we have ivory. Ivory is made from elephant tusks, and a lot of ethical groups got involved and decided that they didn't want people to be able to buy ivory, trade in ivory, because usually this is harvested in an inhumane manner. When they get the tusk, the elephant bleeds to death. So some groups decided to outlaw this. And the only way to buy ivory is you have to actually document that the ivory came before a certain year before this embargo went in place. So you can buy antique ivory, but not new ivory in order to discourage this trade practice that is considered unethical. Like most things, trade barriers will be beneficial to certain groups in the economy and harmful to other groups in the economy. They're not just good or just bad for overall. So trade barriers are going to be beneficial to the domestic producers. So domestic producers are people that manufacture that product in your home country. Because remember the word domestic means home. So if the country is discouraging um, the import of any sort of product, people that produce that product at home will get that advantage because their competitors have been removed. Trade barriers are harmful potentially for consumers because if there's, there's two factors at play. If there's less competition and there's a limit in the supply of the product that's only manufactured here, both those things are going to have the effect of raising prices. And so not only do consumers pay higher prices, but it also limits the amount of jobs in that industry and in trade and it also can impact the profits for people that would want to import. So the domestic manufacturers can export whatever products they want, but importers who might, let's say, specialize in a product overseas will be hurt if there's a tariff or a quota or something that limits their access to the good that they would like to sell. So in terms of pure economics, and we're not talking about diplomacy or foreign relations or any of those things, from a purely economic point of view, 
free trade is considered more efficient in terms of allowing competition and lowering prices. One interesting example of quotas is the U.S. government actually passed some laws that mandate that 85% of the sugar sales must be domestically grown. So that means that the overwhelming majority of the sugar that you buy in American grocery stores were grown here. And any excess sugar, because only 15%, can be grown elsewhere. So all of that excess sugar that's brought in, the government actually buys up and stockpiles. So you can see here this man walking by a warehouse with these bags filled with sugar. Now the government uses the sugar um, in order to, if you limit the supply, it will make the price of the sugar market go up. And the government sometimes sells off their stockpiles to ethanol producers, but they sell this at a loss, meaning that the government is losing money in the deal. Consumers have to pay higher prices, even though sugar isn't that expensive overall. And the people that benefit, of course, would be domestic producers of sugar. For fixed exchange rate countries. They have set their currency to have a fixed value in relation to another currency. But they do have the option if they want to change that fixed rate to a different fixed rate. So maybe they want to raise it from $2 equals 50 pesos to $2 equals 100 pesos if they wanted to change the set value. They can go through the process of revaluation, which is raising the value of your currency in a fixed rate system. Devaluation is lowering the rate in a fixed rate system. So both of those two terms only apply to fixed exchange rate countries. For a floating exchange rate country, we would talk about depreciate and appreciate, but these two new words, devalue and revalue, would not apply. Exchange, uh, fixed exchange rate nations also can choose to get rid of their fixed exchange rate altogether and move to a floating exchange rate if they would like. In the Module 43 notes, we learned about the fictional country of El Tigardo, who had a fixed exchange rate system where the Tigra was set at two US dollars equals one Tigra. If the central bank or the government of this nation wants to change the fixed exchange rate, they have that ability. So if they go from one Tigra buys two US dollars to one Tigra buys 1.5 US dollars or $1.50, they have lowered the value, but they have intentionally lowered the value. So instead of talking about depreciation, we would call this devaluation. So in floating exchange rate systems, prices can go up and down naturally compared to another currency. That's depreciation. Devaluation is when the fixed target rate is intentionally lowered. So the government has to decide to lower the fixed value in order for it to be considered devaluation. So both of them start with this prefix of D, like decrease, but devaluation is on purpose. Depreciation usually is not. Why would a nation want to devalue its own currency? If you're thinking in a simplified manner that lowering the price of something isn't good for the economy, we have to remember that that isn't necessarily true. In a recessionary gap, El Tigardo would have the incentive of wanting to encourage trade. They would want to encourage net exports and overall demand in products made in their country. So if they devalue their currency, it would take fewer U.S. dollars to buy one Tigra. So goods produced in El Tigardo are now less expensive for American consumers. So you could encourage people to come in and buy products. And this would be a way that they could help their economy get out of this recessionary gap. Devaluing the Tigra. 
would make American goods more expensive because that means that the Tigra is cheaper, but the dollar is more expensive than it was for people in that country. So people in El Tigardo are not going to buy as many products from the United States. So they will decrease their imports from the United States. But their own devalued currency means that their products are cheaper to American citizens. So they will export more of their own products to the United States. If you recall, the net export equation is just exports minus imports. So if exports are going up and imports are going down, this is still going to have an overall increase in their net exports. More money will be coming in from these American consumers. That will make aggregate demand shift to the right for, for the country's perspective of El Tigardo. That can boost their real GDP, and that shift in their aggregate demands can get them out of the recessionary gap. One way that a nation can intentionally devalue their currency is through using monetary policy. We can see from the next sentence that we're going to increase the money supply. So would that be expansionary or contractionary? That is expansionary monetary policy. And let's walk through the process of what expansionary monetary policy would do to see how that will impact the overall value of the currency. So skipping down here, increasing money supply. If MS shifts to the right, interest rates will fall. There's always an inverse relationship between money supply and interest rates. If interest rates fall, capital inflows will also fall because foreign investors will be less inclined to put their savings into American assets if they're going to earn less interest. If capital inflows decrease, people in other countries have a reduced demand for the currency because they're not going to want the currency if they're not going to buy as many assets that they would need to pay for with that currency. So when demand goes down, that depreciates the currency. Now, we now can see that the act of expansionary monetary policy can lead to depreciation. I'm mixing the words devaluing and depreciating here because it's important to see that any country that does expansionary monetary policy could have the side effect of depreciating their currency. And some countries might not be trying to devalue their currency, especially if they have a floating exchange rate regime, then devalue isn't an option for them anyway. Their exchange rate is just going to fluctuate, and deciding to get involved with monetary policy could have this effect. So universally, expansionary monetary policy depreciates your currency. In the case of a fixed exchange rate nation, they might do this on purpose if they're trying to devalue their currency. Devaluation is when a fixed rate government intentionally lowers the exchange rate. If a fixed rate government wants to raise the exchange rate of their currency, that's called revaluing. So if now they want one Tigra to be worth three US dollars, that would be an example of revaluing the currency. Revaluing functions like appreciation, but again, it's fixed exchange rate only. A nation might want to revalue the currency to get out of an inflationary gap. In the inflationary gap, your overall goal is to reduce aggregate demand to return to long-run potential. And one way to do that is to reduce net exports. So if the Tigardo, if the Tigra currency has revalued, that's the same thing as appreciating. It now buys more. Um, so it takes more US dollars to buy one Tigra. So goods produced in that country are now more expensive for Americans. So that's going to decrease the amount of products in your country that you will export to America. If your country has appreciated the currency, then that means the trading partner has depreciated. So American goods would be less expensive to people in your country. And so they will be able to buy more products from America. 
import products in. For net exports, basically the bottom line to know is if it's going up or going down is whichever is happening to exports is happening to net exports. So if exports are decreasing and imports are increasing, the overall effect would be that net exports are decreasing because the thing that brings money in went down and the thing that you subtract went up. So there's going to be a net decrease. If net exports decrease, aggregate demand would shift to the left and that would get us out of the inflationary gap. A nation can go through the process of revaluing their currency through contractionary monetary policy. So the idea is if they decrease money supply, we can sketch this very briefly. If you decrease money supply, that left shift in money supply makes interest rates go up. If interest rates are higher, the amount of capital inflows that you have will go up. And just to review, interest rates are the double shifter for supply and demand of currencies on the foreign exchange model. So let's review that one more time. If interest rates are high, that means people in other nations will want to buy assets in your country, so the demand for your currency will go up. It also means that people in your country want to keep their money at home and those investments that will earn them the higher interest. They have no incentive to invest abroad if they're going to earn higher interest here. So the supply of your currency in the foreign markets will decrease. So when you use monetary policy and it changes interest rates, both those shifts on the Forex model are going to have the effect of appreciating the currency. Now appreciate and revalue have the same meaning in the sense that both of them mean that the exchange rate of your currency went up. The only difference is that revaluing was done intentionally by your country if you have a fixed rate regime. Devaluation and revaluation can also be used to fix surpluses or shortages that are created in the Forex model because of your fixed exchange rate. So in both of these models, we can see that the fixed exchange rate is $1.50, and this other currency is called the Gino. So the fixed rate is one Gino is worth $1.50 US. Now, in both of these pictures, the current equilibrium is not matching up with this fixed exchange rate. In the first picture, equilibrium is below the target rate, which creates a surplus. And we can tell because if we trace this line across, we're going to hit demand before we hit supply. So if supply is bigger than demand, that's a surplus. This government, if they wanted to keep this $1.50 exchange rate, they're going to have to intervene in the market and perhaps change the supply of their currency to move equilibrium back to the correct price. So one way they can move one, something on this model is to decrease supply, and that puts it back at the right level. In order to decrease supply, remember a government can buy and sell its own currency on the foreign exchange market. If they're trying to decrease supply, do they want to buy their currency or sell it? They want to buy it. If they buy up these extra stores of their currency, then that means that there's less of their currency around. Now, if they're buying it up, they're going to need to pay for it with a third currency. They can't use their own currency, Gino, because trying to reduce the supply of it by replacing it with the exact same thing is ineffective. And they can't use the US dollar because that would affect the supply of the US dollar, which would change its exchange rate. And if they're trying to fix it to that, it would be very inefficient. So they're gonna have to have a stockpile of third currency to do that. On the right, we have a shortage because the equilibrium is above the fixed rate. So keeping it at $1.50 would make demand bigger than supply. That's a shortage. So here they also could shift supply. And if they want to increase their supply, they could sell their currency. That makes more of their currency available at the foreign exchange market. If there's more of a supply of something, the price goes down. 
So all those things are what they would have to do constantly if the equilibrium rate is not lining up with what their target rate is. If a country is tired of keeping these stockpiles and always spending money manipulating their exchange rate, they could choose just to devalue or revalue to fix the problem. In the model on the left, in order to get to equilibrium, they're going to need to lower their fixed rate. Lowering would be an example of devaluing. On the right, to get to equilibrium, they're going to need to raise the exchange rate. And raising a fixed rate is known as revaluing. So we saw how monetary policy works in a fixed rate regime and how it can be used to actually revalue or devalue a currency. It will work very differently in a floating exchange rate regime, and we're going to see how if the exchange rate is floating, how there might be more than one shift that occurs from the monetary policy. So countries can use monetary policy to get into or out of recessionary gaps or inflationary gaps, but using monetary policy because it affects the supply of your currency and the interest rates will also change your foreign exchange rate. Through this example, we're going to look at Mexico. Mexico has a floating exchange rate, and we're going to be looking at Mexico's exchange rate with the U.S. dollar. So we're going to compare trade between those two countries. Now, in this case, if the Central Bank of Mexico decided to increase the money supply, first of all, would that be expansionary or contractionary monetary policy? It would be expansionary. And if they increase money supply and MS shifts to the right, interest rates will fall. Now, here's something we haven't talked about in a while. We have been talking about how interest rates affect international investment, that capital inflow of foreign investors who want to buy CDs and earn a set interest rate. Domestic investment is all about people in your home country. So this domestic investment is investment spending by businesses at home. And domestic investment functions differently and responds to interest rates differently than foreign investment. In this case, domestic investment is investment spending where they have to pay interest. So if interest rates fall, domestic investment would increase. That's totally different from foreign investors who want to earn interest on those interest rates. So if domestic investment or investment spending increases, that's part of GDP. And if investment spending goes up, aggregate demand would shift to the right. So if we are drawing an ADAS model for Mexico, aggregate demand would increase because of this expansionary monetary policy. That's all the same that we've seen so far, but we're going to add in what that will do to the exchange rate of Mexico. So that expansionary monetary policy decreased interest rates. So when interest rates go down while domestic investment spending goes up, foreign investors will not want to invest as much in Mexico because they're going to earn lower interest rates than they would before. So the demand for the peso would decrease. Now remember that interest rates are the one double shifter. So they affect demand in terms of people in other nations and they affect the supply of people in your own country. So citizens of Mexico, if they are looking for a place for investments where they're going to earn interest, if the interest rates in, in Mexico are lower, they're going to want to go to a place where they will find a higher return on their investment. And if they're going to invest in other countries, the supply of the peso in international markets would increase. So we have two things. We have increased supply. We have decreased demand. Both of those, while they're different shifts, they have the same overall effect, and that is that they make the peso depreciate. Go ahead and sketch it and see how when supply shifts to the right and demand shifts to the left, both those things make the peso depreciate. 
because of the change in interest rates, the peso was depreciated. So in terms of trade between Mexico and America, if the peso is depreciated, Mexican goods are less expensive to American consumers. So from the Mexican point of view, if their products are cheaper, there will be an increase in net exports. Americans will want to buy more products from them. So the exports from Mexico to the U.S. will increase. And a depreciated peso means that Mexicans can import fewer American goods. So net exports will increase. Net exports are part of GDP as well. Remember, anything in SIG XM can shift aggregate demand. So originally, the expansionary monetary policy made AD shift to the right because domestic investment spending went up. That leads to the peso depreciating, which increases net exports, which creates a second shift in aggregate demand also to the right, but it's going further. So imagine AD shifting right and then AD2 shifting even further to the right. This would only happen in a floating exchange rate system. So because of the open economy, changes in interest rates go further in countries that have floating exchange rates than in countries that have fixed exchange rates. So in the example that we just went through with Mexico and the United States, where both nations had a floating exchange rate system, changing money supply changes interest rates. The interest rates shift aggregate demand when we look at domestic investment spending, but that also leads to a change in the exchange rate, which shifts AD a second time. So the floating economy, AD shifts twice. In a fixed rate economy, the original thing would be true, that interest rates will shift aggregate demand because people in your own country, uh, businesses will determine if interest rates are down, this is a good time to do investment spending. But in a fixed rate economy, you can't change the value of the currency. This second shift that would normally occur won't happen in a fixed rate economy because the government would intervene. They would move the fixed rate back to where it should be before the change to net exports had occurred. So the second shift in AD that was created from net exports gets blocked in a fixed rate economy. The next section to get into is international business cycles. And that's the idea that whether or not you have a fixed or a floating exchange rate, in open market macroeconomics, things that are happening in one country will affect another country, especially if that other country is a trading partner. So recessions can spread. You can imagine that a recession in Canada, the biggest trading partner with the United States, if we're used to them buying a large amount of American products and all of a sudden their economy is suffering, that means they're going to start decreasing the amount of American products that they purchase. And that decrease in the net exports can cause a decrease in the real GDP in the U.S. And if real GDP and aggregate demand decrease, that actually can create a recessionary gap. So a recession for our trading partner can create a recession for us. So you can imagine how things like the Great Depression absolutely can spread from one country to another because of all of the connectedness with trade, with international loans. Those things are not isolated to just one part of the world. Let's walk through the process of a recession hitting a trading partner of ours. So if Canada had a bad recession, not only are Canadians going to buy fewer products of their own country, you can imagine that their overall demand for products made anywhere would decrease. So they will reduce their demand for goods made in America. Therefore, American exports to Canada will fall. And net exports are part of aggregate demand. So if the demand from the trading partner goes down, AD will decrease. It will shift to the left. And that's how it can create a recession for us. 
but it goes further because both the nations were talking about how floating exchange rates. So if a trading partner of ours is buying fewer of our products, that means that they will not need as many U.S. dollars for those transactions. So it will decrease the demand for our currency. And when the demand for our currency goes down, that will mean the U.S. dollar depreciates. It goes down in value. So there will be additional ramifications, not just the fact that we're now in a recessionary gap. To be clear, could you use the word devalue here or just depreciate? just depreciate for two reasons. One, we don't have a fixed exchange rate. And two, the government didn't intentionally lower the value. This value was changed due to market factors, the fact that demand decreased. Now here's where things get interesting. So the recession in Canada created a decrease in demand for the US dollar, which meant that the dollar depreciated. Now that will have an impact. A depreciating US dollar means that American goods are now comparatively more affordable to Canadians. Now you can imagine, if you're going through a really, really bad recession, there are some people in Canada that still won't buy products. But for those that are shopping, if they could buy something in Canada or they could buy something in America and the American good is cheaper, they're going to buy the American good. So the fact that our floating exchange rate depreciated means that all of a sudden they will start buying a little bit more of our products than they were previously. So aggregate demand will start to shift to the right a little. It won't go back to where it was because people who have a recession still aren't going to go on these wild shopping sprees. But it helps. The fact that we have a floating exchange rate allows this overall decline in aggregate demand to be reduced. AD shifts to the left because the net exports decrease. But once our dollar has been able to depreciate, the exchange market actually allows us to start self-correcting. And that weak dollar is going to bring back in some of that Canadian uh, demand for our goods. So the moral here is that floating exchange rates help to insulate nations from, from recessions. Are we impacted? Yes. But we're impacted less than we would be if we had an, a fixed exchange rate that couldn't depreciate. Because if our currency was not able to adjust, we would have no way to respond to this recession. And our aggregate demand would be further away from potential than it would be otherwise. Floating exchange rates are definitely better off when it comes to global recessions because as we saw, that effect in aggregate demand was lessened after the depreciation. Now, if we weren't so lucky and we did not have a floating exchange rate, if it was fixed instead, a recession within a country that was a major trading partner for us would have a much bigger impact and could cause a quite large recession in this country. The reason why is that we would have the original decrease in aggregate demand caused by the decrease in net exports from that trading partner. But not only would the dollar not be able to depreciate, but when it started naturally falling, we would have to intervene in this exchange market to put it back to the set fixed exchange rate that we had before. And the act of intervening and putting the exchange rate back actually worsens the problem, as we'll see on the next slide. If we had a fixed exchange rate, the recession would start the process of depreciating our dollar, but we would have to step in to keep the price high and not let it depreciate. So all of these intervention methods are intended to raise the exchange rate and keep it in line with a fixed rate that we would want. So the first one to raise the foreign exchange rate would be to reduce supply of our currency in the foreign exchange market. If you reduce the supply, that makes the price go up. So remember, to reduce supply, are we going to buy our currency or sell our currency? 
We're going to buy our currency because if we are in possession of this currency, it's no longer circulating out there for everyone else to access. So it has the effect of reducing the supply. The problem with this solution is that buying up our currency would cost the government money. We would have to use our foreign exchange reserves, our stockpiles of additional currencies in order to do this. So if we're going through a recession as a nation, this is something that would cost us more money, just kind of throwing it at this problem to affect the supply of our currency. If we didn't want to do that, we also could use monetary policy. So to keep the price of our exchange set with this fixed value, we could reduce our money supply, contractionary monetary policy. If we reduce money supply, that increases interest rates. Yet again, we're going to see the difference between foreign investment and domestic investment. Foreign investment are those investors that are wanting to earn interest rates and they're going to send capital inflows over. So if interest rates are high, do foreign investors like that? Yes. So that will increase, that will encourage people coming over for that reason. So it will impact the demand of our currency and it will keep the exchange rate in line with what we want it to. So it fixes our fixed rate issue. But higher interest rates would hurt domestic investment spending. Those businesses in America now can't do all of those capital investment projects that they want to do at the high interest rates. So if investment spending goes down, AD shifts to the left. So we already had a recession because Canada had a recession, so they're buying few of our products. And now if we decide to intervene because of our fixed exchange rate, that intervention leads to aggregate demand decreasing further. So now we have a second 80 shift even further away from our potential and the recession got worse. So in this case, floating exchange rates have the original left shift of AD when there's a recession in a trading partner, but then it shifts a little bit back to the right because it depreciates. In fixed exchange rate, they have the original decrease in AD but then you can have an additional left shift of AD, if we, especially if we use monetary policy in order to put our fixed exchange rate back where we want it. So floating is the one that insulates countries from recessions. It won't be as bad. And that's why a lot of major global economies like the United States have decided to keep their exchange rates floating.